Thank you, Jolo. I need to say that I am... I was the... Because my grandmother and my father and my mother prayed for me. That's why I'm here today. And I didn't know that. It was only at my, my, my grandmother's funeral that it, was, it became known to me. The Duomini said, Do you know that your grandmother, every day of her life, she prays for you? And that stuck with me ever. And that's why I will not stop praying. No ways. I'm speaking about praying, it's opening prayer. <laughs> Father, we come before you this morning and we just become quiet. And I ask, Lord, that you have the floor, Holy Spirit. This is your sermon. I make it known. I do not lean on my own understanding. And I pray, Lord, that the foundation that has already started being, that was already prepared, Lord, that you will just take it from there and just flow with it. That you will touch the hearts of every person here today. For this word, Lord, is yours. It comes from your heart. And I thank you for this, Lord Jesus, because you are a faithful Father. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so talking about prayer. Can you? Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, that's nice and loud. Okay. In my prayer time on Thursday, you see, we're sticking with the prayer here. While I was praying, while I was worshipping, the Lord spoke to me and it was just this beautiful few words that just meant the world to me. He said, this is what I've done for you. And immediately at that moment, everything that he has been working in my heart for the last few weeks, actually the whole last few years, came flooded. And it, it just brought a revelation because... As we have said before, while we are preparing for our sermon, you don't know until you stand here if everything will fall into place, but it always does. And at that moment, I knew that God, thank you. This is your message. I'm standing back, you take over. It is, when I'm talking about this is what I've done for you, let's talk about that just for a split second. Jesus. God sent his son, Jesus, for you, for me. When I think about the crucifixion, I know or I try and envision what went on in that cross. At that moment where he gave up his life willingly for me, for us, the pain, the suffering, everything that went through him. You know, if you do not feel well, your body rebels. It, it wants freedom, it wants, it wants the pain gone. He didn't fight it. Not one split second, even while he was tortured, even while he was whipped, he didn't even rebel. He didn't speak a word. He kept on reminding himself of us. We were on his mind. And if that is not, not overwhelming enough, let's talk about what happened when he took all our sins, all our iniquities, all our pain, everything under this earth or the, under the sun, everything that you can think about. As I said, when you feel sick, you want that sickness gone. He said, no, give it. Every horrible thing that anybody can do to anybody, he said, give it. I'll take it. I'm doing this for them. Now you must know, it didn't come one by one, it flooded him at once. How overwhelming is that? You can't, I can't, it, you can't even contemplate it. From this pulpit, messages of faith, messages of the love of the Father, the healing power of Jesus, surrendering our hearts to God, Christ is our strength, fellowship, hope, power in fasting, waiting on the Lord, bitterness, the hunger for God, obedience, and last week Pastor Chris spoke about the fear of the Lord. All of these messages are meant for us to realize what we have in Christ, who we have in Christ, Him and Him alone. And these messages were only from November. So it steers you in the direction of Jesus. I want to ask you a question. During a day, the chances are excellent, 100%, that you're going to Look in the mirror, okay? If you're a woman, you're going to do it more than once. 
But when you look in a mirror, you see yourself, okay? What do you really see? Do you stand in front of the mirror and start finding fault? Or, you know, my hair is not good today, I've got grey hair, my ears are a little bit too big, or my neck is not the way it should look, or, or I really need to do this, or, or do you stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm God's creation? Do you dare look in yourself in that mirror and see Jesus? Because let me tell you, what he's done for you, and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior means you belong to him. You have the right to stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm a child of God. I see Jesus. That is why this morning's message is, Christ has set us free. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to see how he set us free. We're going to see what he's done for us. And we are going to accept it because you have to. It's in the word. It is in this beautiful book that is called the Bible. It's his word. It's him. It's God. It's God breathed. It's him. The first verse is Genesis 1.27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. He created you. He created me in his image, not ours, his image. That means when you give your life to Christ, you belong to him. You are a new creation and you have been set free. I listen to my colleagues, I listen to the conversations with my friends, with you, and we talk about ourselves in so much doubt, we don't see the value that we have in, each, in, in ourselves, let alone in each other. We shouldn't be talking like that. We should guard our mouths at all times. And if it, we dare open it, let it be the truth, the truth of God. Galatians 5.1 says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get, uh, and don't get tied, up, tied up again by the slavery to the law. You know, if God has set you free, why would you want to go back to what he has saved you from? Why do you need to go back in that old rut, that old way of living? That's not life. That's punishment. We are meant to live free lives. God has paid for us that with his blood. Let's go look at the meaning of set free. To liberate someone or something from the imprisonment or confinement. To release someone or something from some obligation, from a control or restriction. So let's look at it in one sentence. You have been liberated from the imprisonment and the confinement. Therefore, you have been set free from every obligation, from the old lay of living, from the control that you were kept in prison, from the restrictions that, that was put on you by yourself and others. Have you ever seen a lion in a cage? Those eyes are dull. There's no more fight in them. And even an elephant. I know when my kids were small, we took them to, I think it was those days, the Playland or Happy Valley or something, and there was an, an elephant standing. He only had a chain on his, on his foot, and it was like only this deep into the ground. And what's going through my mind is he can just lift his leg and we are flat. Now you want me to touch this animal? I don't think so. But that animal has been programmed. He has been in imprisonment for that so long, almost most probably even his whole life. And he can't get free because in his mind he is in a cage. And that's the way we live. We walk around as if we are in prison. And you know what? When God has prayed the past, we can just walk out in freedom and say, Lord, I'm taking what you're giving me. Romans 6, 7 to 11 says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For the death that he died, he died to sin over. Oh, sorry, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. We've been freed because he purchased the price for us. You are dead to sin. You do not need to live that way anymore. We don't have to live in those bondages. So once you accept Jesus Christ into your life through faith, because that's the only way you're going to do it. You can't say, okay, Lord, here I am. There is something that you have to do. You have to declare with your mouth and with your heart you say, Lord, you are my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I want to be yours. If you do it by faith, you step out in faith, and you can only do it through Christ. The word says you can't come to, G- uh, you can't come to God on your own, on works. It doesn't work. It's got to be through Jesus. You've got to go through him. He is the key. So once you've become, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior through faith, the basic reality goes to work. Your old nature that has died, that spiritual death. Now I want to, just for those who don't know it, we live in a sinful body, okay? But we are spiritual beings. So that when I say we die to self, we die spiritually. We've died spiritually. We are no longer connected to those things that hold us captive. In the spirit. Yes, we might be fighting in the, in the flesh. You might be fighting if you had a problem with alcohol. That bottle might look very tempting, but you have the control to say, you know what? I've been set free. You are not my boss anymore. We have the choice to say it. We our old nature has died. That sinful self has died. Even though it is a spiritual reality that you are dead to sin, moment by moment, you must activate the reality through faith. This must be an action that you do. I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. You must make the decision to say, I make a choice. Now, how do we do this? Through the word of God. But you have to believe what this word says. You have to believe what is in this word. Many of us have a bottle, a Bible. Some of us have many. But unfortunately for some of us, it's a dust collector. You can write your name on it. We like to clean it, just to make sure that nobody sees there's dust on it. But when last did you open your Bible? When last did you read the word? When last did you feed on the word? When now did you speak the word? That's the key. You see, we, we're so quick to say, if someone is sick, I believe that there's healing in the word. We speak the word of God over someone else. But when it comes to yourself, you think, you know what? My sins that I've committed, the things that I've done in my past is so big. God can never forgive me. The word is not for me, it's for someone else. It's always something else. I say, why not start with yourself? I say, let's start with ourselves because you can't help someone if you are not filled with the Word of God, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, if your relationship is not strong with our Lord and Jesus Christ, our Savior. It starts with us seeking His face every single day. Apostle Paul says it so beautifully, it's not on the overhead. It says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Ha, ah, but there's, there's another word. He says, of whom I am the worst. So he says, I'm the worst. He came to save us all, but I know I'm the worst. And let me be truthful here today. There's been days that I have said, Apostle Paul, Paul says, I think I might give you a run for your money because I'm not perfect. God knows I'm not perfect. But thank God for his mercy and his grace upon us. Now, as I said, we are spiritual beings. And how do we fight against the enemy? How do we put our foot down? How do we acknowledge? How do we do this? We do it in the spirit. We don't go out and fight with our fist. No. We fight our battles on our knees. We fight our battles in the spirit. And we compare this 
to a Roman soldier. You've all seen a movie where a Roman soldier is, stands before you, and we all know he wears this armor, okay? So he's wearing a belt, and he's wearing his breastplate, and his, his helmet, and his shoes, and it's not slip-ons, it's like a whole shoe, it's like the whole outfit this man's wearing. And then he comes with his shield, and he's got this big sword, and he's ready to fight, and this is how we do it. But this, today, I'm going to concentrate on the sword, oh, sorry, on the belt, because why the belt? It's the very first, the very first item he puts on. It is important because... Everything else fits onto this armor. If you don't wear the belt, it's not going to work. So it's called the belt of truth. John 32 says, For you shall know the truth, and the truth sets you free. And when we look at Ephesians 6.14, it says, Now stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. You put it on. You put on that spiritual belt. And let's look at five things that the truth does. The truth exposes lies. A lie cannot be where the truth is. If you tell the truth, the lie will be exposed, let me tell you. Truth brings good news. It brings the good news. Truth brings freedom. The Word of God is the good news. The Word of God is the freedom. It brings the good news and the freedom. The truth is God's standard. Family, nothing is higher than God. His standard, he can't even go against his own word. His standard is high. And the truth is only found in Jesus. That's why we say it's through Jesus. He's the key. You can't do it on your own. There's a reason the devil uses lies and God speaks the truth. God exists before creation. We know that he created everything. His divine nature belonged to him before anything else happened. Everything God, everything God does comes out of truth because of who he is. Over and over again, God has proved himself. Just think for a split second in your life. What has he done for you? How many times have he saved you? How many times has he been there for you? Do you think he's not going to come now? Of course. He's already prepared the way. He's just waiting for you to walk it out. And you know the good thing is? He walks with you. You're here never alone. The word says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And in the future, he's there. He's waiting for you. But we need to seek the word. We need to seek more of him. And as I said, it's in the word of God. This is your manual for life. So how do we do this? You eat the word. You speak the word. You proclaim the word. You sing the word. And you be the word. Because we've also said it many times. There are people out there that don't know the word of God. And you become the word of God. You will be the word of God. So that when you face someone... They see Jesus in you. They don't see you. They first see Jesus. You are only the vessel for Jesus. Family, when we pray, we speak to him. We speak to Jesus. We speak to him. But when we read the word of God, he speaks to you. If you, are not, if you have a question, if there's something on your heart or something in your mind that is heavy, take it to God. Take it in prayer and speak to him. He's your father. How do you speak to your father? You speak to him with love. Acknowledge him. Be truthful. Say, Lord, I'm struggling. I need your help here. My heart is sore. I'm worried. And then afterwards, you go to the word. You're going to get your answer. That's what we say before you read the word. Pray. Pray so that you know that when you read the word, you're going to get your answer. Now you must wonder, okay, why am I struggling? Because of our identities. We struggle because of what we have been taught, what so many has been 
putting on us, the world tells us, if you dare put a TV or a newspaper or anything, you don't even go down Cape Road without hitting a billing board that says doom, gloom and destruction or this price has terminated or the petrol price has gone up, it's like a yo-yo. All of these things put a damper on you. It, it makes your identity, you feel so, you can't do anything about this, worthless. You feel as if it's out of control. But that's where we need to remember. Even though things are out of control, we have control. His name is Jesus. Our identities are in Him. Now when we look at the word identity, it is defined as the following. If you look up identity in the uh, dictionary, it is defined as a set of qualities and beliefs that make one person and group different from another. We we are not like the world. We are on our own. Christians are set apart. 2 Timothy says, and our purpose is to bring glory to God at all times. We're not to boast in our own strength. We're not to say, you know what, I can do this. No, we bring glory to God. We say, I can do this because God gives me the strength. I lean on Him. He's going to give me the wisdom to get out of this mess. He's going to guide me. He's going to lead me. Our identities must be secure in Christ and that you can only find when your relationship with Him is strong. So this morning, we are going to look at a few verses and things that the Word of God says about us, which means this is what God says about you. And you're going to look at it and you're going to receive it and you're going to believe it. So the very first thing, I'm coming from. The very first thing is, the Word of God says in Romans 5, 8, you are loved and accepted, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Word of God says in 30, uh, Psalm 34, 4, you are delivered. I sought the Lord and He heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. The word of God says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, you're approved. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God. At all times, we bring God the glory who tests our heart. The word of God says in 1 Peter 1, 2, you have been chosen. You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. The Word of God says in Isaiah 43.1, listen to this, you have been redeemed, which means you have been saved, you have been vindicated, you have been rescued. That alone makes my hair stand up straight. That alone is enough to make me rejoice. Now it says, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by your name. You are mine. How beautiful is that? He's saying to you today, don't be afraid. I'm calling you by your name. You are mine. You are mine. Now the word of God says in 1 John 1, 9, you have been forgiven. You've been forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And lastly, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says you are holy. Yes, you are holy. But you are chosen generation. See, he says it again. You have chosen you. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that they may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. 
Do you get it, family? You have been chosen. You have been forgiven. You have been approved. You have been delivered. You have been loved and accepted. Do you get it? Now I want you to confess with me. And you better confess loudly. Okay? You ready? I want to see if you're awake. My identity is in Christ. My identity is in Christ. Awesome. Awesome. I can work with you. Okay. So, but why do we struggle sometimes to believe that? What is it with us? Even though we've confessed it, there's still that nagging voice that says, uh, 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 uh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's self-doubt. It's self-doubt. Oh, and how easy is it to receive that one? No. Today, we're going to put it to bed. Today, we're going to tramp on it, and today, we're going to say no more. Self-doubt or your insecurities, where it comes from, is a lack of confidence. Proverbs 18, 21, it's not on the overhead, gives you a clue where it comes from. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it eats its fruit. You know that, that, little, that little muscle in your mouth, that little muscle that can build up, and can destroy in a split second. That little words that you speak, that when it slips out, you can't get it back. Doesn't matter how many times you've apologized, if it's out, it's out there. It hurts. We need to guard our mouths and only speak life. Listen to this. In the verse, it says, the tongue has the power, okay? So power, <clears throat> the word power, if you translate it, or the Hebrew word for power is yad. It's Y-A-D, yad. And if you translate, uh, translate that, it becomes hand. So actually, the tongue is like the hand. Okay? So the tongue can build up. The tongue can speak beautiful things. The tongue can tell you how beautiful and lovely you are and how much you love someone. But the tongue can also say you are nothing. You are a disgrace. I don't like you. I reject you. The same with the hand. The hand can do damage. It can hurt you. It can break. It can kill. It can steal. It can destroy. Or the hand can heal. The hand can uplift. The hand can bolt. So you see, your tongue is like a hand. Before you lash out, be careful what the hand is doing. That is why it's so important to remember who you are. So that you know the truth because you've been set free. So that you know the truth that you don't speak it over someone else. That is why it's so important every time you speak, speak love. Speak the truth over someone in love. I'm going to explain two people to you now. It's both apostles. The one is Apostle Peter. Now, Apostle Peter, when I think about him, I just picture this man that sometimes spoke too soon. Okay? He had a, a very willing spirit. He was, he was a go-getter. Okay, so it says, Peter was an uneducated fisherman when he encountered Jesus. And Jesus called him, he said, Simon, follow me. And Simon did. Simon became an apostle. He became an apostle of Christ. His identity as a fisherman was not changed, but defined or refined as a catcher of souls. So he doesn't change Peter. He refines him to a catcher of souls, no longer catcher of fishermen. We see that he was strong in his convictions and his identity led him to many apostles. You know, he was looked at upon as a leader. And later on, he was called the rock of the church. But personally, as I said, when I think of Peter, I think of this man that was a go-getter. He was, he was ready. He was on fire. And he was the only one that got out of the boat. Something to think about. 
He didn't stay in the boat, he got out of the boat. And then, of course, when you speak about Peter, you know that he rejected Jesus three times. I know. That's an inner one. We read in, verse, in Matthew 26 from verse 74 and 75. It's not on the overhead. But actually, if you read the whole Matthew 26, you'll see the story unfold. And I'm paraphrasing here. It says, Peter swore, a curse, a curse on me if I am lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. So this means he's already denied him to us. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. What did he do? He ran away. He wept bitterly because he knew immediately what he did wrong. If you read on, you'll find that Peter didn't run away. He came back. Before Jesus ascended, he said to Peter, do you love me? How many times? Three times. He called him, he said, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I do. Feed my sheep. Look after my shepherds. He knew his identity was in Christ. He came back. So no matter what you've done, come back, your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. Now the other one is someone that we don't really speak about. Judas Iscariot. Funny enough, when you speak about him, you, you feel this unsettled in, in your stomach. But he was also a disciple of Jesus. Jesus has been with, oh, sorry, Judas has been with Jesus most of his ministry, hearing him teach and seeing his miracles. And yet Judas never committed his life to Jesus. He lived only for himself. His motives were for himself. It says further on, his story stands as a sober warning at all times, reminding us the dangers of a superficial belief in Jesus. Why am I saying this? Many of us come to church because you've been asked to come, or it's a ritual, you do it. Two Sundays ago I asked you, why are you here today? Were you asked, or did you come out of an obligation? Is a Sunday morning the only time you open your Bible? Is a Sunday morning the only time you pray? Is a Sunday morning the only time you worship? And when you, the service is finished, you're out of here, and the Bible gets put in the boot or in the car or wherever, in your bag, and you forget about it, and you don't speak to him for the rest of the week. But you call yourself a child of God. But you don't even bother to speak to him any other time of the week. We can't let this happen to us. We know what happened to him. We know what happened to Judas Iscariot. He killed himself because he knew what he did was wrong. We've got to be so careful to not become the, the ice cold life that we live. You know, the word of God warns us in Revelation, do not be lukewarm. I will spit you out. You either ask God or you piping hot. Let us be piping hot. Let us be on fire for God. Not ask cold. There's no place for the fence. You know who sits on the fence? The devil. He sits on the fence and he watches everything. Don't sit with him on the fence. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 is a warning to us. And it's something we don't want to hear. Those words must not be spoken to us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And this is what Jesus will say. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We don't want those words. 
we have a chance today, not tomorrow, not next week, today. We have the opportunity and the chance today to say, Lord, forgive me. I have been lukewarm. I have been the one that only makes time for you on a Sunday morning. I need to change my life and it starts today. It needs to happen. You need to be committed to him completely. God is waiting for you to take your eyes off what you are facing because at this moment, some of us are facing things that are a giant to us. But you know what? We forget who stands behind us. We forget the one that's bigger than any mountain. He's the one that created all the mountains. They must bow down to him and they will. But you've got to get out of the way. We can't control anything and everything. We, we can't. We've got to give it over. As Pastor Chris and Jobu says, we've got to surrender to him. Philippians 3.3, 3, it's not on the, on the overhead. It says, and this is my last verse. For if we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, Again, it comes back to it. Do not depend on yourself. We can't. We need to depend on God. It's all for His glory. We've got to get rid of the flesh and heal to Him. Today, family, I pray that you will surrender your hearts once again to Him. Our identity is firmly anchored in Christ's compliment, uh, com accomplishments, not ours. His strength, not ours. His performances, which means what he's done in the past, what he's doing right now. Even though you don't see it at the moment, he's busy. He is busy. And his victories, not ours. It's not about us, family. It is about him. I want to ask you to please bow your heads. Father, we come before you today. We've surrendered hearts, Lord. And we repent, Father, for trying to do this on our own. For trying to work our way back to you, Lord. We can't. We can only do this, Lord, by surrendering our hearts to you and say, Lord, please, we need you. We need you, Lord, because you are the way, the life. We can't live without you, Lord. If there's anybody here today that does not know Lord Jesus as his Savior, I want you to put up your hand. Nobody is looking. If you want to commit your life to Christ, just lift your hand. And if there's anybody here today that has drawn away from the Lord, that has gone cold, that is not where he's supposed to be, you know you're supposed to be on fire for God, but you're just not ready. You're not there. I want you to please, out of faith, lift your hand and say, it's me. It's me. Let me pray for you today. Before you leave this house of God, let us make it right with God and let us surrender our all to Him. You are not alone in this. As He says, He's waiting for you. He wants to have that intimate, personal relationship with each and every one of us. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love and I ask, Lord, that you will flood them with your love. That you will reveal yourself to them, Lord. Like only you can, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we never forget what you've done for us. We praise and honor your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm in front if you need any prayer.